If you could have a drink with anyone in the theater world, who would it be? I'm Anthony Caparelli, and I'm running through my list. Each week, I'll sit down with cast members, bartenders, and personalities from New York's theater district and get a behind-the-scenes look at what it's like to live, work, and play on Broadway. Come have a drink with us on Broadway Bartender. Welcome to Broadway Bartender. My name is Anthony Caparelli, and we are here, as always, at New World Stages in the heart of Manhattan's theater district, home to my show, The Imbible, A Spirited History of Drinking. And this week, we're going to open with a moonshine drink that I created in honor of our special guest. And we're going to start with a mixing tin, and I'm going to put some ice in, and then we're going to use about an ounce and a half of moonshine per drink. So that's three ounces total for the double batch that I'm making. And then I'm gonna put about a half ounce of simple syrup per drink, which is one ounce in this double batch. And the juice of fresh lemons. So I want one full lemon per drink. And so I'm gonna do two into the tin. And as always, when I'm using fresh citrus, I'm gonna take the last half of the lemon, what we call a hull, and I'm gonna drop it into the tin so that the alcohol can absorb all of the essential oils from the skin, which is where really most of the lemon flavor comes from. You can see those oils just puffing up around me and you can actually see them all on the skin of that lemon. I'll pop that right in there. And then I wanna shake this up really good so I chill and dilute the drink and also allow those oils to be dissolved by the moonshine. So if you're paying attention, it's probably occurred to you this is really nothing more than fresh lemonade with moonshine in it. And that's exactly what it is. Really, really old school drink from the American South. They've been drinking this for a long time. Really refreshing and beautiful. Coming back into fashion now with all of the new moonshines and white whiskeys that are available on the market. And I'm gonna just strain this into a couple of mason jars with fresh ice and then garnish it with a fresh lemon. And this again is a drink that I call the Tug Fork for our special guest, Caleb Damschroeder. How are you, my friend? Good, how are you, Anthony? Good, good. Cheers, Cheers welcome to, to Broadway Bartender. Thanks for having me. Mm. Woo, that's nice, delicious. Nice and tart. That'll get you up in the morning, huh? And, and put you to sleep at night. And put you to sleep at night. So why did I pick a drink from the American Southeast? Well, I am working on a musical about the Hatfields and the McCoys. OK, great. So you are, and you got a lot of titles after your name, actor, composer, lyricist, probably a bunch of other stuff. So tell me about this musical. Sure. It, um, I was watching an episode of How the States Got Their Lines, and they were talking about the border between Kentucky and West Virginia. And then they were talking about the Hatfields and the McCoys and the family feud, historical family feud that went along with them. And I thought that might make a really interesting musical. Yeah, um, I think it would. With uh, moonshine making a reoccurrence as well as like bluegrass music and banjos and things. And so I started working on a musical and I brought a book writer on board who thought it might be interesting to tell the story from the perspective of the women. Because so many of the accounts that we have of this story are all from the male perspective. And all these women existed, but they don't really exist on the history page more than just the name and like who they were. So we've decided to come into this story from what it would mean to be a woman in like this time post-Civil War on the border of Kentucky and West Virginia. Wow, so what's the perspective they're bringing? Like how it affects the, their lives specifically as women or like what's, what's the difference in voice from what we sure. normally hear? All, well, all the main characters are women. Okay. And so everything is told through their perspective and what it means to be a woman at that time. And also what we're trying to create with this story specifically is that the women kind of held all the power and the men got all the glory. And the women's were the one that were keeping the lid on the pot you know, to let, not let everything explode as the men were the ones that wanted to do all the exploding and whatnot. Really? Yeah. So how much of what the average person knows about this story is historically based, is accurate? Sure. I mean, the feud itself is historically based, as well as the characters and the actual events that go on uh, throughout the musical. And the characters themselves are all historical characters and relationships to each other. And because 
uh, there isn't a lot written about the women. We kind of have some artistic license in being able to add our own flair and our own take on the story. So we're blessed with uh, them kind of being erased from history, and hopefully we can bring them to the forefront. Were you able to find some good historical documentation on yeah. the women that were involved? Oh my goodness, yes. There's a lot of stuff that you can find online now, um, and there's a lot of documents like uh, from the libraries and things down in that area, as well as many um, different accounts uh, in autobiographies and things. And the nice thing is, is at that time nobody really read or wrote like around that area, so everything is oral. So even a lot of the books that I've read contradict themselves, which gives us plenty of artistic freedom as well and which path we want to take. Hmm. Why did this feud become so iconic? I mean, what was it about this, this particular two-family thing? Uh, I think it kind of all stemmed from the Civil War. We were a country at war, and we were on a border of that uh, part of the United States, and some of the people in that family fought for uh, the Confederacy, and some fought for the Union. And so the feud itself, I think the deepest roots are an extension of that, because the Civil War had just ended, like when like the largest part of this family feud was taking place. But but the actual incident as to how the family feud began is still kind of something that is, they say it began over a pig. Right, that's um, what I've always heard. Yeah, but I mean, some say it began over pigs, some say it began over other things. So it's just kind of uh, hearsay, I guess, as to what the original reason was. And a lot of our story uh, rotates around Rosanna McCoy falling in love with Johns Hatfield, which is historical as well, and their relationships. So it's kind of, that's where the dividing line of our story takes place. So. I mean, clearly, it seems like there are some um, analogies to like a Romeo and Juliet sure. kind of thing. And Rosanna and Johns and R and a J. Although right we're there. specifically trying to write away a little bit from that, so it's not just an Appalachian Romeo and Juliet. Right. And so that's where our take on um, the women comes into play. The men don't. The men sing plenty in the show, but they all kind of sing as the ensemble. And when it branches into actual songs for just main characters, it's only women that are singing like those songs. So it sounds like this particular story is emblematic of a lot of common themes that resonate throughout history, including like all the way back to Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. which obviously predates even Shakespeare's telling of that yeah. story. Um, but even even uh, to the point of allowing sort of America to view itself sure. uh, during the Civil it's War still through the through timely. the eyes of these. Yeah. Exists today, and like our main theme is about like love and who do you choose in family or a lover or uh, uh, loyalty, and and how do you remain loyal to your family while remaining loyal to yourself while remaining loyal to a lover, uh, and whatnot. So. Am I reading too much into it to see that, I mean, in my mind, it would seem that this is particularly relevant in, term, in light of the current political climate where people take politics mm -hmm. that I think the average person would, you know, you would think at first blush that you would be a little bit removed, but they take them very, very personally Certainly. to and the point where interpersonal relationships are, are, are sometimes violently affected yeah. by, by political um, allegiances. Absolutely. I mean, we started writing this piece before this most recent election, but even like in families like with this election, you know, like some families like went one way and some went the other way and it's a very hot issue and it still like resonates today. I was actually just talking to a friend who was telling me that they um, are no longer speaking to a, a cousin yeah. over political beliefs sure. now. So it, 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 is it something that you think is particularly American? Or do you think it kind of goes beyond that to just human nature? I think it goes to human nature at large. I mean, I don't think that that's necessarily something that's maybe right now in politics in America, it's something, but I mean, the Middle East and religion and things, I mean, that's still a dividing line, you know, as other things around the world and in different countries. So I'd like to think it's a universal theme all the way around the world. And perhaps in America right now, it's political, but hmm. I think it's a timely story and one that resonates quite. I think it's fascinating that, I mean, I've always been, you know, fascinated by the whole, our, our tendency as human beings to, to brand ourselves, mm -hmm. whether it's like, I'm a Mets fan, you're a Yankees yeah. fan, or I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat. I think it's almost, you know, in addition to like food, shelter, and reproduction, I think it's probably the fourth most driving goal that we have. And people will die mm -hmm. for their tribe. Yeah. You know, they want to be part of a tribe, even if it's in name only. Right. And, and this seems to just be um, uh, just a, a really um, uh, distilled Wow, <laughs> did I just yet? <laughs> a distilled version, thank that. you, I didn't, I didn't mean yeah. uh, version of that sort of drive and, and that tendency in, in humanity. Sure, and that's what we're trying to play with is loyalty. I mean, uh, how do you stay loyal to yourself 
you know, with these beliefs and these labels that you want to put on yourself, and how do you stay loyal and stay a family unit, you know, in the midst of all of that. And so the women's perspective now, because obviously when you take this thing to its logical conclusion, whether it, it's you know global warfare or these local feuds, the the the, the logical conclusion is often very destructive, mm -hmm. if not to the to both parties, at least to one party is the goal. Right. Are the you said the women are kind of keeping a lid on it? Are they are they presenting that sort of um, sort of you know hey if we all kind of need to figure out how to make this thing work if we all want to move forward perspective? Or, we have, um, or like, they become just as partisan as, as the men? It depends. I mean, it's a, it's a question to, all, uh, to ask ourselves, I guess. You know, like in this show particularly, we have the women moving about in the trees, having secret meetings in the woods and discussing issues that they're discussing at home, but coming together to be able to kind of uh, put the kibosh on things before they begin. But then as the story progresses, there's like a crucial moment in the story where some of the women have to decide that their loyalty is going to lie more with their family than particularly with the truce of like one of the women of the other families and then things progress and I don't want to give too much away. No, but that's not so the women from, from the Hatfield and the McCoys are meeting each yeah. other. Uh-huh, oh yeah. Wow. Secretly, I mean, so you got Roman and Julie. It almost seems like there's almost like a little Lysistrata in there sure, too, yeah. where it's like the women are like, you know, lobbying for mm -hmm. peace at any cost. And this is fascinating. Okay, so tell me more about it. where can I see it when? What's the deal? Well, tell right me about now, it. Right uh, now, we are going to be part of the uh, Pitch, which is a New Works festival up at the Finger Lakes Musical Theater Festival. Oh, cool. At the end of July. Oh, so you can get some good wine up there too. Yeah, oh my goodness. They have great wineries <laughs> up there. That's awesome. Right? Um, uh, we'll be up there for a week. Um, and in that series, you actually pitch your show. The writers actually perform a one hour segment of the show for an audience as if they're pitching it and then you get feedback and you do it three different nights with three different audiences and continue to develop um, themes and, and ask questions and really kind of fine-tune the piece. So that's where we are right now with that. So did you, you did what now on this? You I wrote, wrote the music and the lyrics. And the lyrics, and yeah. you said you brought on a book writer. Yeah. And are you gonna be in the piece as well? Or? When up in the Finger Lakes, the writers have to present the piece, so I will be there. However, uh, in the grand scheme of the piece, I like to wear a writer hat and then take that off and wear an actor hat. Sure. And I don't really like the two to mix, at least yeah. not for me. Well, this sounds like a fascinating piece, literally with themes that reverberate as, as far back as we you know, probably have been dramatizing yeah. things, right up until stuff that was in the papers like yesterday. I mean, really, really great subject matter, and I'm fascinated to see it. So good luck with that. Thanks so um, much. You have some other stuff going on, I too. Do. Tell me about some other things. Please. Yeah. Um, I have another piece that I'm working on uh, that I wrote music and lyrics for as well. Uh, it is an adaptation of a Brian Friel play called Molly Sweeney. And for legal reasons, the musical is called Molly Sweeney as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, it's uh, the play itself is an Irish play, and it's about a woman who has been blind her whole life, and those around her convince her that she's missing out by not being able to see, and so she opts to have the surgery uh, to restore her sight, and then the world as it is isn't nearly as beautiful as the world that she can no longer return to. And so we've uh, reset it in New England. Uh, rather than Ireland, and uh, we were part of the New Works Festival out at Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor this past spring, and now we're back like in the Rewrite Land. Themes. That's fantastic. I, yeah, I just look for things, and when something seems interesting to me, you know, I try to jump in and go for it. So it would seem to me that this is fertile ground for a composer because the play is about visual experience. Sure. Oh yeah. And you're translating this to music. Oh yeah. Right. It's great. How how did you go about that? What were you know what was that like? I mean, it's really a fascinating subject, and to have one of the main senses, like sight, not be part of it for a main character you know and then have like music be such a, a thing it, what I really enjoyed particularly as a composer um, is uh, at one point she sees the sunrise for the very first time and just being able to write music for that for someone experiencing that for the first time is something that it was so thrilling to me and I think it plays quite well and hopefully it'll be thrilling for the audience too when they get to see a production. Wow, it didn't sound like another great one that I can't wait to see. So what's going on with that? Where's the... Uh, rewrite you said land, okay. as you do. <laughs> you do a reading, you do a reading, and then you rewrite, and then you continue to push it along. Now you just list. did a reading Yes. at... Uh, Bay Street Theater in Sag Harbor. Which is, I mean, one of the top theaters in, yeah. the, in the area. Oh, God. It's we fantastic. So to have it yeah, there. yeah. How was that? That was fantastic. We had Mamie Paris on board playing Molly Sweeney. We had Jim Stanek with us. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was a, a wonderful experience. We learned a lot. 
Um, and now we're going to uh, change the things that we feel need to be changed and then continue to push it along. Well, good luck. I look forward Thank to you. seeing that one as well. As do I. So, <laughs> so tell me, I, I, I said actor, composer, lyricist. Sure. So what are you doing with the performer kind sure. of hat on? Um, well, I am trying to make a buck, like most <laughs> actors uh, tend to do. Um, you have some you? Broadway stuff in your, in your, on your resume? I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the most recent revival of Cabaret. Uh, we had quite a, a starry cast for that. Yeah. We had a wonderful time and just a, such an iconic piece. And being able to look at that through a writer's lens, I mean, Kander and Ebb. And so to be able to play that score as well, because we were the orchestra as well, just like as a writer to me, that was so invaluable to be able to be part of it as an actor and to like flip flop between the two, you know, yeah. in the brain. Yeah, I think it's always fascinating when the musicians are actually visible on stage and then when they cross over and become actors yeah. as well, it lends a whole other layer for the audience to sure. experience. And that, that show, I mean, it's the perfect example to me of when the book is as strong as the music, oh, what absolutely. you can really achieve yeah. in, in, in the musical world. It's fantastic. Off. He would come almost every week and just sit there, 93 years old, and watch the show. Really? I can only imagine what that would be like to see oh, it through man. so many incarnations. And speaking of relevancy, I mean, that piece is just as relevant today as well. You, you don't want it to be, but, no, but, but it, it absolutely is. to turn up and turn up. Yeah, sure. I know, I know. Um, your role in that, though, really interesting. Yeah. Is it half swing? Is that right? Well, we were labeled as partial me. swings because we were all the instrumentalists as well. We would all be part of the um, orchestra every night. And then when you were swinging on for the different roles, when this song where you normally play the banjo, you would set the banjo down, come down the stairs, do whatever part you were in for, and then in the same way that the ensemble worked, mm -hmm. um, and then come back up. So we were part of it every night, but then it would change every night depending on who we were in for and, and who was out of the show that night. It was wow. a, a big puzzle. I bet. How long were you with the production? I did the whole thing. You did, yeah. really? Oh yeah. Oh, that must have been incredible. It was. It was quite the experience. Wow! Congratulations. Thank you. So, any bartending experience? Did you, how, I couldn't imagine you would have had time. Doing well, it with I job. mean, there was a time before all of that. <laughs> you know. Tell me about that, by the way, before sure. I throw you back here. How did you get into this whole? I mean, actor, composer, lyricist, all these wonderful projects. How does this all come about? I mean, this is like people. You know, this is this is people's dreams to be to be working on sure. this kind of thing. I mean, I mean, I always uh, enjoyed music, and then I found the community theater in my hometown and saw how like musical theater like worked and fell in love with that and found like a home and a place to belong. And so when I graduated from high school, I couldn't decide if I wanted to be a music teacher, if I wanted to be an actor. So I started college as a music teacher for two weeks and then said no thanks. And then uh, <laughs> I went the other route. So even though I was uh, in school and doing uh, acting in shows, I was also still in uh, the orchestra and in the wind ensemble and everything. So I kept those skills sharp as well. And so when I moved here, I hit the ground uh, as an actor. And then as things progressed, I just saw things being produced and said, hey, I can maybe do that. Someone's got to write it, you right. know, like it can be me. So I kind of put my musical uh, brain to use with that and, and try to get sharper and sharper as you do. That's fantastic. What's your primary instrument? Uh, well, I mean, I play the piano. I, through college, I studied bassoon. Um, and then uh, That's via cabaret, That's great. I learned to play the banjo because we needed a banjo player. And why not? Why not learn how to play it on someone else's dime? Of so course. Banjo, bassoon, piano, to answer the question, I guess. How long have you been playing the piano? Uh, since I was uh, 10, 11, maybe. So it's in your soul, man. Yeah. That's oh, what, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's what you do. Yeah. And then Absolutely. singer also, I'm sure, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Okay, so, you want to make a drink? Yeah, let's do it. Can right. I finish this you one can, first? You, you don't have to finish it, but you can certainly can have a little bit it? more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Three, so, two, one. You can beat me. I'm not a good chugger. Mm. We'll call it nicely Ooh, done. Dead. So, uh, this drink is an homage to the your second piece that you're working yeah. on. Um, I'm gonna, but I didn't realize that you had moved it to New England. So I called it a Dubliner. Actually, I didn't call it. It's, it's a drink. It's called sure. a Dubliner. Okay, great. Um, and it's a version of a Manhattan okay. made with Irish whiskey. Great. Want to give it a try? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So you, you never asked my question. Have you bartended before? Are you yeah. A oh yeah. Oh, I mean, so it's gonna catering, be easy for you. You know. So uh, you know how to make Manhattans. Uh, well, sometimes you just say you know how to do things and to then get the you job, do them. and then right, you keep exactly. the iPhone under the counter. And all right. So why don't you step back you here and I'll talk sure. you through it. Okay, so you have a mixing tin right there. I want you to fill it about halfway with ice. All right. And you should have an ice scoop in the in the well. So a traditional Manhattan is made with rye whiskey, sweet vermouth. Okay. Uh, it's usually stirred 
and then uh, topped with a couple dashes of bitters and some maraschino cherries. All right. uh, but this is what we're going to make with uh, Irish whiskey. Great. So in the speed rail there, you have a bottle of Irish whiskey. Perfect. And you're going to do uh, two ounces per drink. Okay. And it's going to be that's going to be an eight count. All right. So you're going to count to eight. It's going to take Wait a little that. while. Yeah, go for it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. And then we're going to use uh, some sweet vermouth. Got it. We have some Antica Formula sweet vermouth. And we just want a half ounce per drink. Okay. So that's going to be a two count. Great. A one and a two. Fabulous. And then there should be a bar spoon uh, right over there. And I want you to just kind of stir that up really, really well. Yeah, look at you with this. You know See? what you're doing. Oh, this, this is part fantastic. I know. That's the ingredients. Great, you know. great, great. Now, there's one other ingredient in this drink that's not in a traditional Manhattan. It's, okay. it's Grand Marnier, sure. which is orange cognac. Okay. So there should be a bottle of Grand Marnier down there. And I want you to just do about another one count of Grand Marnier uh -huh. into the tin. Are we done stirring? Yeah, you can just put it in now and then start up a little bit more to get that Grand Marnier in there. A one count. Great. And another spin. Just get that in there. Fabulous. And then we have uh, a strainer right over there and you can strain that into our cocktail glasses. Oh man, you're making my life really, really Ooh. easy, Caleb. Look at you. Psst. I'll light it on fire, too. I, I bet you will. <laughs> and write a soundtrack for it. Right? <laughs> Look at these pores. All right. Make it frothy awesome. on the top. Yeah, this was not fixed in post, by the way. He no, just did that. No, this is it. This is it. Nicely done. How about a, a cherry on each one? To hit it. And that is our that is Dubliner. You. Thank you, man. It's gorgeous. Cheers, you come back friend. anytime you want. Cheers. Oh, that's nice. And this is Teeling Irish Ooh. Whiskey. It's one of my favorites. That's wonderful. They do okay? Yeah, you know what we forgot though? This the is bitters? my bad. We forgot the bitters. Yeah. yeah, I want you to do a dash of bitters in there. Just I was the just so left, blown away by your whole that technique. Good? That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that goes really well. We're using orange bitters to go with the Grand Marnier. Oh, nice. Orange liqueur, and let's see what that did. Well, let's give it a second cheers wow. and a second sip. See, and that you get right on the nose, right? That orange oh, bitters, yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Whew. Mm. That'll knock you down. Oh, that's lovely. I think I found the new bartender. Hey. Dude, thank Happy you so much, man. That's awesome. Okay, so how do people find out about you and all these great projects? Oh Website, social media, what? Uh, at Damn Caleb, Caleb Dam Schroeder. I used to be at Caleb Dam, but then when I joined Twitter, a 13-year-old in Florida had it, so we changed <laughs> it to at Damn Caleb. Uh, so follow me there, and I'll be able to uh, make announcements and things on there. On I Instagram love it, and man. Twitter. Good luck with everything. Thanks Dying to see both those productions. I mean, they, they both sound really, really great. I appreciate it. Folks, again, as always, you can check us out on broadwaybartender.com for recipes and links. Thanks for joining us. Drink well, drink responsibly. Cheers. Cheers. This is good. While you're enjoying your cocktails, we have Caleb Dam Schroeder performing Fly Away from his original musical, Devil's Kin. Fly away. Fly away. Get as far as you can go from here. Fly away. Fly away. You must take that child and disappear. Down the road and through the valley from the only Fly away, Rosanna, you must go. Fly away, fly away, there are things that I can't. This girl must never know this place Through the trees and from this mountain Find a land where you can learn But fly away, my angel Fly and promise you won't return You must promise me you
I'll be there inside your heart But you must go and fly away Though it's tearing me apart You must finish what you began Roseanne Oh, Roseanne my Rosanna, you must fly because you can. That was Caleb damn short of performing his original song, Fly Away, from the musical he wrote, the music and lyrics to Devil's Kin, right here on Broadway Bartender. It's called Fly Away. The matriarch of the McCoy family, Sarah McCoy, sings it. Uh, spoiler alert, some people die in this musical. <laughs> and uh, uh, a big battle has happened between the two families, and Sarah has lost some of her sons and Rosanna has just had this baby, uh, this Hatfield baby, and uh, Sarah is seeing herself in Rosanna and seeing that this cycle will never end. This cycle will always continue. Rosanna will be growing up in the same way Sarah did. Rosanna will have children that die if this feud continues. So uh, Sarah makes quite a sacrifice and tells Rosanna, like, get out of here, like, uh, go on. Okay, I'm excited. This literally touches on like all the things we talked about, about how this perpetuates through the generations. Right. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right, let's do it. Okay. Bright Star. This is a recent musical by Steve Martin and Edie Brickell, right? Yeah, so Bright Star was uh, kind of inspired by a true story about a baby that was tossed off the side of a train um, in a telescope bag and survived. What? Yeah, so Edie found this article um, about this baby and started writing songs based on it and they wrote an album together. And from there, they kind of thought that it would be interesting to explore its dramatic content. So they okay. tried, they staged it um, originally as an album version, and then they discovered they needed to write new songs. So they wrote like a, a completely original bluegrass score to uh, kind of accompany this, this American story. Mm -hmm. 